Thank you so much for doing that. So it looks like this meeting starts at the top of the hour. <clears throat> so I want to welcome everybody to the December Bank Forum. If you're calling in, please make sure that you're muted um, or if you're on Teams, um, go ahead and mute. We're going to save all questions to the end um, after the presentations. Then. So our forum is on developing and managing a service catalog. And we have two presenters today. We have Jacob Lebman and Jason Rood. Um, so Jacob is a performance manager with EIS with a background in history and sustainable business. Um, and he's always working to help build strong foundations for organizations to achieve long-term sustainability while providing consistent value to their um, stakeholders. And Jacob is currently developing key performance management assets from process maps to metric portfolios. And then Jason Rood is a seasoned IT professional with a proven track record in strategic planning, vendor management, and leading state enterprise IT initiative. And Jason excels in developing and executing program management plans, optimizing operational efficiencies, and implementing innovative IT solutions. Um, as a program manager at the State of Oregon's Enterprise Information Services, or EIS, um, Jason has demonstrated expertise in data governance, project tracking, and vendor management, contributing significantly to the advancement of IT infrastructure and state governance. We're very happy to have you guys today. And with that, I will pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we're very excited to be here today. Uh, we appreciate you all uh, having us here. Um, this is uh, this has been some exciting work for us uh, over at EIS. Um, we've had a good time. Honestly, this is a exciting work for um, for data governance and transparency. Uh, we've been working on a service catalog. Uh, for a little while now um, in collaboration as well with the Project Portfolio Performance Group, EIS, and uh, we're to the point where we are, we actually have uh, part of our service catalog published. So uh, we thought this would be a great opportunity for us to walk through uh, what that process has looked like. Um, you know, this is uh, a result of several years of lessons learned and, and um, you know, various uh, practices being applied. And uh, I think that we have a pretty solid foundation for uh, how we can consistently and effectively build a service catalog um, within the state government uh, context, as well as um, we're trying to take us to a point where we're really uh, focused on the customer, as, as that's obviously a, a huge point for us here yeah. at the state. Uh, and there's been increased um, emphasis on that to from uh, from a leadership standpoint. So uh, again, thank you all for having us today. Uh, and uh, I'm Jacob Lubman, um, the person sharing and the person who will be doing the uh, second part of the presentation here is Jason Root. Uh, and we'll get started. Uh, so um, we've broken this out into two parts. Uh, the first part I'm going to be covering, which is uh, service development. So basically, we're going to go through why specifically service development is such an important uh, initial piece of developing a service catalog. Um, we'll talk about how you actually develop those services, what the value is in doing that. Um, we'll talk about how you identify the services that you want in your catalog, um, because obviously you can't just go from zero to 60 in, in 3.5, as we'd all like to. Uh, but the we want to start with a uh, minimum viable catalog, if you will. Uh, so how do we choose our initial services to effectively uh, move from where we are right now, which is in a lot of cases, we don't have a catalog to a place where you'll see, Jason will show you later on, uh, we have our initial catalog deployed. Uh, next, we'll talk about the workflow of what that looks like. Uh, so 
how, what is the cadence for actually developing your services? Um, what can you expect in terms of workload, that sort of thing? And then we'll talk about the specific deliverables that support that work. Uh, so what can you expect to produce as a result of the service development work that you've done? Uh, and what will that set you up to do uh, in the next phase, which is the building a service catalog piece? Uh, so do you want to talk a little bit about the building a service catalog, Jason? Uh, sure. So we talked a little bit about the foundations of a service catalog. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it to make sure it's working right and you're serving your customers well and providing value. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we included when we launched our service catalog and what we didn't. Also, we're going to talk about how you expand your service catalog because uh, you'll hit some low hanging fruit, you'll hit priorities, and then you'll probably be wanting to grow out your catalog. So we'll talk a little bit about how we did that. Uh, finally, I would never uh, launch a service catalog without some kind of continuous improvement process behind it because you want to continue delivering services that your customers value a lot and getting better at what you do. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about managing performance and making sure that you're always uh, delivering exactly uh, to the expectations of your customers and your leadership and your staff. So those are the five areas I'll be covering. Perfect. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so service development. So why is this such an important part of uh, what it is we're going to do with a service catalog? Uh, the obvious answer, right, is that a service catalog is made up of services. Uh, so how do we actually tackle that? So uh, we're going to start by laying the groundwork. Uh, so let's assume for, for the sake of argument here that we're starting with nothing. Um, so we need to identify the resources we have that work with our services. Uh, that's typically going to be your subject matter experts. It's going to be folks who actually operate your, your key processes. Um, obviously, you want to engage leadership. Um, you're going to start then by developing a list of your services. Um, so this is, as Jason mentioned before, I uh, usually want to start with low hanging fruit. Uh, some services, as we determined uh, during our foray into this, uh, can be a little tricky to nail down. Uh, really, at this point, you want to look at the, we know that these are the key services that we offer. They'll often be some combination of uh, ones that are related to key programs that you have, uh, ones that are mandated either by the legislature or they're they're part of some you know, grant that you're a part of, whatever it happens to be. So you want to start with the ones that are, you know, for fact, this thing that we do, we provide this to a customer, people ask us for this, it's, it's a major part of what we do. Uh, so you start with that service list, and then you figure out uh, what kind of outcomes are you trying to get from this. Um, you know, you in this case are probably going towards a service catalog, uh, but you also want to say like, do we want to have this on our website? Uh, is this something that is going to be in a published document that we want to hand to people? Because as with anything, for you know, whether it's a project or whether it's a, a service catalog or whether it's just you know, uh, a body of work you're trying to accomplish. Uh, you want to know what outcome you're working towards, uh, and it'll be a little different for everybody. I mean, we had a pretty clear idea of what we wanted our outcomes to look like, and you'll see what it translated to for us, uh, but it will probably look a little different for every agency and, and every division. So uh, get your resources together, develop a service list, and then start playing the outcomes for what you want your service catalog to look like. Uh, then you actually get to defining the services, and this is that service development piece. Uh, so you'll see that I have four deliverables uh, that we'll walk through a little bit later on uh, that I've found to be kind of the straightest path to go from we have nothing related to a service to we are ready to actually plop it into a catalog. Uh, so I'll walk through each of those four different deliverables. We have uh, tools available for folks uh, afterwards. Uh, they've been kind of de-identified, uh, but there are things that you can use uh, moving forward if you want to try this approach. Uh, we have blank versions of a lot of the stuff that we've developed internally uh, that hopefully will be of some assistance to you in doing this process on your own. Uh, and I'm sure you'll hear this a million times more in the presentation. Uh, you're always welcome to ask us questions. Um, you know, send us an email afterwards. Uh, that's you know, we're, we're happy to help. So uh, all of that is to say uh, you want to define your services. So the first thing that you want to do in most of these cases, once you have your service named, is do a logic model. Now, 
folks have probably encountered logic models in a lot of different ways before. Uh, that looks like it can be called a mental model, um, logic model, of course. Um, you'll often run into this with programs. A lot of programs will have a logic model associated with them. Uh, this is used uh, a, a great deal in kind of planning processes. So logic models really just are a way for us to uh, document all the information related to the service uh, to help us get a better understanding of what the service looks like. Um, you know, its name, who the customers are, a description of it, the basic activities associated with it. So that's a really important first component and probably the largest lift in terms of time uh, for doing this, but it really was an invaluable process for us as we did this internally. Uh, this is where most of our opportunities for improvement came from, honestly. Uh, we learned that there were a lot of ways that we could uh, better align the work that we were doing. There was a lot of clarity that we needed to get uh, as it related to the services themselves. Uh, so this is, I think, a really critical first step in developing your, your services uh, is making sure that you have documented everything that actually encapsulates what that service does. Uh, and you'll see a little later on, I'll show you what the what a completed one of those can look like. Uh, and it uh, really serves as the core foundation for your service development work. Uh, next, you're going to develop and map processes. In a lot of cases, you'll have a process that already exists. It's just a matter of, of mapping it or even just checking the process map that already exists to make sure that everyone's in alignment around it. I won't talk too much about process maps. I'm sure most of us have seen process maps, but basically we just want to make sure we know the different components that go into completing the process and we know who's responsible for them. And then the last piece is identifying existing data and metrics. So you want to figure out, do you have data that already exists somewhere? Uh, if so, great. You want to make sure that you know how you access that, um, how you can pull that for uh, the purposes of tracking success. Uh, and then you make sure that you develop a metric that actually shows how successful you're being in delivering the service. Um, I'll talk a little bit as we get to that point about the two different types of metrics that I usually talk about. The first is a process metric. Uh, that is how effective is your process? How efficient are you being? Uh, it's an internal focused one. And then you have an outcome metric, which is really the an external facing how successful is your service being in terms of how you're delivering it. Uh, and then finally, how do we extract value from it? Uh, so you want to incorporate in your trainings. Uh, the performance measure development is its own kind of reward. Um, you get to see how effective the service is being. It helps you with continuous improvement. Uh, and then, of course, you have quality improvement opportunities. Uh, you And this helps you be strategic about how you use your services and how you use your service catalog uh, to more effectively deliver services, continue to build it out, et cetera. So uh, what are the benefits of doing this? Uh, so I, I've broken this down into internal benefits and external benefits. And, and I assume if everybody's here today, you don't need too much. Uh, I don't need to twist your arm too much to get you to be interested in doing a service catalog, but uh, just as kind of a, a way to help sell this. Uh, for internal benefits, as I mentioned before, continuous improvements are a really big piece here. Once you have all of these key documents laid out, uh, it's very easy to engage in improvement activities because you'll have all the information related to the service. Uh, you'll have identified a performance measure. You'll have a process map. It's very easy to go back in and say, OK, this is an area we need to focus. OK, this is the customer we need to engage with uh, in order to better understand their needs. Uh, so this is just as it's laying the foundation for a service catalog, it's laying the foundation for a continuous improvement program uh, for your service catalog as well, which is a really critical piece. Uh, next, it assists with training and turnover costs. So the more documentation you have related to your services, if somebody comes in, for example, uh, and you've just got a new hire and they're going to be engaged in one of the services that you provide, being able to hand them this documentation is a huge help for them. Uh, it shows them how it's done. It makes sure that they're not you know, going off doing something new that is uh, eroding the consistency of the service you're providing. Uh, and it just saves a bunch of time. You don't have to have somebody walk them through it and say, oh, yeah, I think I remember how this works. You know, this is the same as for it, it's kind of like um, 
uh, standard operating procedure manual component uh, for folks who have uh, a SOPM. Um, this is a very similar concept. Uh, this this integrates really well. This work integrates with the SOPM. Um, we've actually done that internally. Um, the Project Portfolio Performance Group did this in parallel with with SOPM development, and it it had a lot of crossover. Um, but it will help you define all of the work that you do, which makes it way easier to bring new people in. It makes, it reduces confusion, uh, it gets things done faster. Um, you know, it, it's just a really helpful resource for onboarding. Uh, as well as for folks who are already in, it's a good cross-training opportunity. Uh, you can just show somebody, hey, here's this service that we do um, in case somebody's out. You know, we'd love to have you hop in and do it. It's easy to explain. You can show them the process map. You can show them what the point of the service is through your logic model. Uh, you can show them, you know, here are the success criteria that we have. And then finally, even for offboarding, uh, it's good for succession planning. You know, this is a way to make sure that you have documented all the things. Everybody has one of these in their organization, right? They have a thing that only one person does. Uh, and you can't even imagine what would happen if they left. Well, if you document that and you get them as one of the subject matter experts in this process, you put this information down in a logic model, in a process map, et cetera, and then you have a succession plan in place. This is a key component of a succession plan to make sure that you don't lose so much of that institutional knowledge uh, that we often do lose when very important people retire or move on to a different position. So uh, this is a great opportunity to uh, really uh, insulate your organization from a lot of that risk that comes from onboarding, cross-training, and offboarding. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, next, uh, we talked about the performance measures a little bit, uh, but performance measures as part of a service catalog uh, help you with strategic direction as well. When you have a body of performance measures, it really gives a larger perspective for leadership. It gives a larger perspective for your team leads on how to make decisions related to service portfolios. Uh, and it helps you better understand how you're delivering your services. So when you look at uh, how you're evaluating service delivery, uh, this is going to be the documentation that you need to look at. Okay, so we have all this data, you know, we we have all this documentation in in aggregate. What is that telling us about how we're delivering our services and how we need to change that? So this is a really good way for uh, folks to better understand uh, what the needs are as it relates to how we continue to develop our services. And then finally, transparency and visibility. Um, this is an internal thing, but it's also an external thing, right? Uh, it help, but it helps everybody within our organization to see what it is that we're working on, uh, and it makes sure that we're in alignment. Um, alignment is a thing that you'll hear a lot during this presentation uh, because it's so critical to understand how the services all relate to one another. Uh, and you'll find that as you do a logic model, you'll see where there are internal relationships between your different services uh, and having the transparency, getting other people within your own organization to understand what it is you're doing, uh, who you're doing it for, really critical. And it helps you uh, better collaborate with the other groups that you have internally as well. So that's it for internal benefits. Uh, there are more, of course, but those are the major ones. Uh, <clears throat> now we have external benefits. Uh, the first and most important is it increases your customer understanding of service offerings. Uh, I can't I can't stress enough how important it is for your customers to understand very clearly what it is you're trying to offer as part of your portfolio of services. Um, when you have a service really clearly defined, uh, your customer is so much more confident in their ability to receive a consistent and effective service from your organization. Uh, and all of this together, all the service development work is going to get you to a point where you can confidently say, this is our service. We're, we're so confident in it, we're going to publish it, and you can click on it and request it. And that is a huge, huge increase in customer satisfaction, uh, customer confidence, uh, as well as it invites them to engage with you uh, in ways to help develop your service catalog. Jason mentioned earlier that he's going to talk about uh, how you expand your service catalog. One way that you can do this is by defining your services really clearly, your customers are able to see where there's a gap 
in services. They can actually help you. You can collaborate with your customers uh, and they can help you grow your service catalog as their needs become more articulated. So this is a huge one, uh, really providing clarity to your customers and helping them understand what services you offer. Uh, the next one, um, these are these these are honestly all the same. The two, three, and four, they look like the same words. They are the same words. And, and the reason for that is these all have external benefits as well. As we talk about session planning and cross training, you know these are these are all things that your stakeholders are going to see an impact from. Uh, this is when when you have somebody offboarded, for example, uh, and somebody contacts the new person, there won't be a service interruption. Uh, there's, they'll have a much better sense of how to deliver that service. You won't have to say, oh, well, we have a new person on. You're going to have to wait a couple of months for us to engage this way. Uh, they'll be able to do it immediately or, or, or sooner. Uh, so this is also a major external benefit. Um, as well as the decision making, your this will look better for your organization. It will help you provide better outcomes to your customers. Uh, and again, uh, the more you evaluate your service delivery, the better you can deliver those services in the future. And then transparency, obviously, I mentioned before, is a big external benefit too, because you want people to be able to see what it is that you're providing. Um, there's no smoke and mirrors. There's no obfuscation of the of the work that you're doing. It's just very clear. Here's what it is we're trying to accomplish. Please help us work with you to accomplish that. Uh, and again, the alignment piece. Uh, you want to be in alignment not only with your own organization, but with external organizations. Um, I'm sure that we've all seen this a million times. How do we how do we collaborate with other agencies? Uh, how do we collaborate with uh, our customer base. Uh, alignment's a really critical aspect. If you're trying to do something that doesn't line up with what your partners are doing, it's a lot harder to integrate that. It's a lot harder to collaborate with them in the future. So that's all the why and the how. So let's start with identifying your services. Uh, so for service identification, uh, we want to focus on first, what actually is a service? Uh, and this is a trickier question than one might think. Uh, you'll note that there's a lot of words here about what a service is. Uh, that's because it's not necessarily cut and dry. There's business services, there's consultative services. There's a lot of different types of services. Uh, so the first thing that you want to think about is a service is usually a value add activity uh, conducted by your organization with a defined customer. And again, that customer piece is really important because a service is a response to customer need. Uh, that There's really two ways, I should say there's two ways that services come about. It's a clear response to a customer need, or it's an implied response to a customer need that has been, uh, that's been mandated by someone else that you're just kind of the steward of. Um, if there's a, a legislative mandate that you know some program needs to happen, the implication is that there's a service that you're actually there's there's a a need that is being filled within the community or you know what have you that your service is trying to to match. So you're thinking about value added activities uh, that are provided to a customer. Um, usually they're going to be requesting this uh, or there's there's going to be some really obvious need. This is why you have the service in the first place. Um, anytime that you generate a new, oh yeah, we have to handle this for somebody, that's going to be a service. Uh, so it can also be thought of as a set of critical activities supporting a program. Um, business requirements, requirements are a good place to find uh, your services as well. Um, you know, there's as you think about what it is that your office does or your program does, or et cetera, uh, most of the major components are going to be services. Uh, we usually think of these as, you know, a program has a package of services. Um, you know, services have underneath them some individual processes. You know, there this is the whole body of work required to meet a specific customer need. Uh, and that kind of flows into number three. It's a customer driven response to an identified need that provides value to the customer. That's kind of as cut and dry as it gets. Uh, and then finally, it's it's a scoped set of work. 
uh, this is really important. Uh, services, it's really easy for us to go off on all sorts of tangents as we are thinking about what a service is and what it isn't. Uh, we really need to define our service. And that's part of that logic model piece. It's part of the process map piece. Uh, it's a scoped set of work that meets specific customer expectations uh, and also supports our organizational strategy and objectives. Uh, we don't want to be doing services for no reason. Uh, they want We want them to align with what it is we're trying to accomplish as an organization. Uh, if you're doing a service that is totally out of left field in terms of what your office is supposed to do, um, you know, it, it just, it, it's harder for you to provide it. It makes less sense for the customer. Um, you know, you're, we're not going to throw in, uh, you know, something for, uh, I don't know, uh, fish and wildlife in the data governance and transparency service catalog. It uh, just doesn't make any sense. So uh, it's it's important that you have a consistent package of services that you're providing as well, because it really helps people understand what the offerings are, how it aligns with your organization strategy. Uh, now, I do, I do have a note here. Um, we're looking at direct service provision. Uh, that's primarily what you're going to have in a service catalog, because when you have an external facing service catalog, it's something that people need to request. Uh, you're going to have availability, and you know, you'll see when Jason shows you uh, what we have set up here a little bit later, uh, you can actually go in and request a service. Uh, those are direct services because they are linked directly to a customer. Uh, so, uh, you know, we want to make sure that it's something that we aren't just throwing out there that the wrong people can request or um you know that that, that our customers can't find uh so we want to make sure that we have a direct line to the end user for our services because that is really one of the most important components of a service catalog uh because it's a catalog right you want to be able to flip through or click through uh and request a service or you know purchase a, a i don't know uh something off of uh, QVC, you know, you get the idea. So uh, we're looking at direct services primarily. There are all sorts of other services that we're not going to be talking about with a service catalog, uh, supporting business services like finances, uh, accounting, uh, telecom, all that sort of stuff. Those are services. They're not part of a service catalog usually because we're just looking at our external customers. So We've talked about what is a service. Uh, how do we choose our pilot services? Uh, what are the ones that we should pick to start with? Uh, we're, we're, we'll call it a minimum viable catalog. Uh, so the first thing is you wanna look at key services. Um, obviously, if it's something that's high profile uh, or if it's something that is really, really critical to what you do as a office or as a program, that's a good place to start. Um, that helps you to you know, obviously you'll have a lot more buy-in usually when you're doing that, uh, as well as it's just something that your customers are going to care about. Uh, easy to document is a really good one. You usually don't want to start with the most complicated thing. You'll find, trust me, as you go through some of these logic models, they can get pretty tricky. Um, there's you, you don't want something that is ill-defined uh, or you think you don't have subject matter experts to work with or there's a lot of contention around. You want to start with something that's fairly easy to document if you can. Uh, next, won't disrupt service offerings. This is a pretty big one. Uh, there are some cases in which there's going to be some decisions that need to be made or um, there's going to be some uh, changes that have to happen that aren't going to take effect immediately. Uh, usually don't want to start with those um, because you're trying to develop your process at this point, do lessons learned, uh, better understand what this work looks like. Uh, try not to do something that's going to disrupt a lot of your services in the first place, because the first couple of times that you run through this, uh, it's going to take a little bit. Uh, the next is you want to make sure that it's stuff that has opportunities for improvement. If it's something that you know you're great at, there's some value there still, but this is a really great opportunity for you to go through the whole process and see, yeah, we did this. We think there's some improvements that we can make. Uh, we're going to change the process around a little bit. We're going to uh, track the information uh, to make sure that we're providing value to our customers, et cetera. So opportunities for improvement are a great thing. Usually these are going to be pretty obvious. Someone's going to say, oh yeah, we're having a lot of trouble with X service. Uh, well, that's a good one to look at because people are passionate about it and it will actually provide you some value as an organization. 
Excitement for change. I just mentioned that. Uh, you want one that people are excited about. You want one that your subject matter experts are passionate about documenting. Uh, this, again, this takes a little bit of time, right? Anything worth doing takes some time to do. Uh, and uh, you need people excited about it, uh, passionate about the work that they're doing, because if not, you don't get as good a product and it feels like a real slog. Um, we had a lot of these service development processes that we went through internally were a breeze. We had a great time doing it. We got excellent outcomes because people were really passionate about the work. And I think it was really clear afterwards which ones we had a lot of excitement about and which we didn't, and there was a big difference. Uh, external pressure or support says you have to change this thing. You might want to change that thing. So just uh, keep in mind, if you're getting a lot of pressure from somebody to uh, take a look at a specific service, might want to look at that service. Uh, leadership support. This is also a huge one. Um, we had excellent leadership support within EIS when we did this work. Um, big shout out to Bettina Davis uh, over at uh, Project Portfolio Performance. She was a huge champion for a lot of the work that we did. Um, so having leadership support will let you get the resources that you need. Uh, it will let you have some leeway in terms of uh, you know how you set up the work, uh, getting stuff on people's schedules, uh, as well as it just you know builds some of that excitement, uh, builds kind of the you, you see that your organization really cares about doing this work. So getting leadership support, whether it exists already or you need to drum it up, really important. And then finally, having comparable service assets. Uh, what this means is if you have similar documentation somewhere else within your organization, it can be a lot easier to kind of do a comparison, pull a lot of that information out. It, it just saves you a lot of work. Uh, if you have, for example, uh, within data governance and transparency, we have uh, built a boilerplate request fulfillment process. Uh, if you have something that has a request that needs to be fulfilled, you can start with a basic request fulfillment process and get a lot of the way on your process map. So if you have similar assets to the services that you're trying to look at, that will save you a bunch of time. So those are the eight things that you should probably be thinking about as you look at choosing your pilot services. Um, those will help immensely in terms of getting the work done, getting it done in an efficient time frame, and making sure that there's a lot of value associated with it. So what does this actually look like to do as a service development process? So uh, as I mentioned, there are four deliverables, uh, which I'll be showing you after this. Um, the first is a logic model. Uh, so what this was for us internally was uh, two 90-minute facilitated work sessions to fill out the logic model. Um, it included all of the critical subject matter experts uh, and I think in probably 90% of the cases, we were able to complete it within those two sessions. Um, there usually were things that continued to be added afterwards, but the key elements, namely the activities that the service was engaging in, the customer base, service goal statement, uh, our external factors, our assumptions, those sorts of things were able to be filled out within this time frame. Uh, this is probably the biggest lift of the whole process because it really requires you to delve into what is this service uh, and what should this service be? And this is where you cut out a lot of that extra fat off of your meat. Uh, there's all the extra stuff that's out of scope for the service is gonna come up here. Uh, this is a really critical piece. This is where you make sure that your service is really defined in the way you want to have it defined. Uh, and that allows you to move on to the more specific parts of the process, the the more, um, the more, shall we say, uh, the more defined parts of the process. The next one being the process or service map. Uh, so we have process or service map listed because in some cases, there's a key process within your service that is what you're gonna to wanna to map. Um, in places where there's a sole method of service delivery, this is often the case. Um, for things that are less defined, like a consultative service, you'll sometimes wanna do a service map. Uh, that will basically show like what the flow of the service is rather than a specific process. So that's something to think about um, as you go through doing the specific mapping exercise? Are we looking at documenting the service as a whole? Or are we looking at documenting a specific process that's really critical to our understanding of the service? 
I have listed there two 90 minute sessions as well with subject matter experts. I'll be honest with you, it didn't usually take that long. Um, if you have somebody who's familiar, and this is a, a, a critical piece, if you have someone who's familiar with doing process mapping, um, Visio is what we used. Uh, but if you have somebody who's familiar with Visio, you can breeze through this pretty quick. Uh, Tim, uh, every, everyone's favorite uh, business analyst. Uh, well, I guess there are probably a lot of favorite business analysts in the in the bank forum. But uh, Tim Roby uh, is a Visio wizard, and uh, we were able to breathe through most of these in maybe a 90-minute session and a 30-minute follow-up. So this can take a, a little bit less time. The biggest piece here in the process and service map area is making sure that you all have the same understanding of what the process looks like. I can tell you from experience, you usually don't. Everybody does something slightly differently. So this is a great opportunity to really nail down what is this process? Because again, consistency is such a major thing for customers. Customers need to know when they request a service from you, exactly what it is that they're going to get because they get something different every time they talk to somebody within your organization that looks bad. It doesn't meet customer expectations and usually there's going to be some blowback from it. So uh, the process mapping piece is a really good area to nail down what your standard work looks like and that all the process steps are the same for everybody who actually operates that process. The next one uh, I call the performance measure implementation plan. And that's just a fancy way of saying you need to develop performance measures uh, to make sure that your services are being delivered effectively. Um, since you're not going to be doing every service in your whole uh, this practice performance measure organization. Uh, so this is just a tool uh, that I use that has all the critical information uh, that you need to go from not having a performance measure to having a performance measure that you're tracking. Um, I'll just show you what that looks like. Uh, basically, you just want to think about what is the service trying to deliver? What do your customers care about? How do we track that? What data do we have that's going to show us how uh, how effective we're being in delivering the service? And then finally, a service brief. Um, this is really the the end piece that you're going to be showing out to your customers. It's the result of all this work leading up to it. Um, how do you sell your service? Uh, what does it look like when somebody clicks on your service? Uh, and you'll see on the on the catalog that Jason's going to be showing you, service brief is right there. This is the only one of these three things that's actually or uh, only one of these four things that actually goes up there and is external facing, but it's built off of all this other work that we've done. Uh, it's a summary of your service. Uh, it integrates all the other materials uh, and it makes sure that people have a really clear understanding of what it is they're requesting, uh, as well as the different elements that go into the service. So, what, did the, what do the deliverables look like? So, I, I threw up... Uh, filled out versions of each of these deliverables because I wanted folks to see uh, when we share out the tools for everybody to use, they're going to be uh, generic. There, there won't be any information in them, but I wanted to show folks what it would look like to have some of these filled out. So we talked about earlier, a logic model is really, you're, you're going to try to document all of the information related to this service. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, this was a fairly narrowly scoped service. To be honest, you're usually going to have more uh, processes, uh, more activities related to the specific one. This is just for a type of training that's offered to project managers. Uh, but this is a service that the Project Portfolio Performance Group offered. Uh, and it was just to project managers with the goal of teaching IT project managers how to navigate the IT investment oversight process within the tracking tool that they have. So as you can see, we have what program it's a part of, uh, what the specific service is, who is actually receiving those services, as well as what the goal of the service is. So all of that together is going to help us understand, again, you know, when we're thinking about performance measures, uh, when we're thinking about uh, what we actually have as part of the activities for the service, uh, we want to make sure that's all in alignment. Uh, so what we had here was there were two elements, actually developing the training, 
materials. Uh, so the training delivery. So the materials are done, the, the delivering the training itself, as well as actually getting out the information to the employees. Uh, so those were the two major activities for this. And as you can see, we had everything that they needed to actually go through and document this. Uh, inputs, really critical one. What do you need to do this work? Um, so they had to develop training videos. Uh, they had to have access to teams. Uh, they had to have email addresses of folks. They had to have their OR number. Uh, they needed to use YouTube to distribute some of these things. Uh, there were email templates that they had. So you want to be really detailed as you go through and document some of these inputs because you need to know what it is you actually have to have to successfully complete this activity. Uh, Two major reasons for that. The first is uh, that it just helps you know what you need to gather as you're going to do it. So again, for like cross-training purposes or making sure that everyone's in alignment, uh, that sort of thing. And the second piece is uh, you need to know who your who is providing these to you. In a lot of cases, it'll be someone else within your organization. Uh, so you need to know who you have to ask for things from. Uh, you need to know, you know, in a lot of cases, you really need to reach out to the train or get some information somewhere from trainees. So this helps you understand what the processes need to look like in order to get you the things that you need to get uh, to successfully accomplish this. Uh, the next one is outputs. So what are you actually producing as a result of doing this activity? In this case, people had approval to, to get into production access. Um, they decided whether or not they were allowed to get into production access. Um, folks actually completed the training and they have a list of users who completed the training. Again, all of this is going to go somewhere. Um, you're going to relay it back to the to the person who requested it. Um, the list is going to help you uh, make sure that uh, you are sharing with folks like, yep, these are the people who are done because that was an input for someone else's process. So we want to be thinking about these as we're looking at these logic models. I, I said the services all relate to one another. It's just a matter of do you have enough documentation to see where they relate to one another? And you can start to see as you do the logic model documentation for each of these different services, where there are connectors to the other services within and without in your organization. Uh, so that all of this stuff is going to come from somewhere, it's gonna go somewhere else. And this helps you figure out not only your primary customer for the service, but who your internal collaborators are and your internal customers, as well as who you're a customer for. So this will really help you uh, develop better relationships and develop better pipelines for how you get some of these services done as you're looking at your inputs and your outputs and seeing, oh, I get this from, you know, over in uh, cybersecurity versus, oh, yeah, when I'm done with this, this actually goes over to an agency uh, to show them which of their PMs has done this. You know, those are important things to think about because those are touch points that you need to have. You need to have built into your process uh, and it shows you who you need to be collaborating with. Now, there's also, as you can see here at the end, outcomes. Uh, we have short term and long term outcomes. Uh, the short-term ones are a condition change. So that's going to be, you know, folks understand uh, the oversight process and how to navigate uh, the process using the tool. And then the long-term ones are the, you know, the impact we're going to see as a result of this service being delivered. Uh, so we are facilitating a more effective oversight process uh, because we're training PMs. And then we're more accurately reporting project information in a standardized portfolio tool because they're using this portfolio tool. So that's just walking you through one of the activities. You're gonna have several as it relates to each specific service. Uh, and then at the bottom, we have assumptions and external factors. I won't talk about those too much um, because those are, well, the, the, as part of the tool that you're gonna get, you're gonna get explanations for all of these as well. So I don't wanna dwell too much on the assumptions and external factors because they're more um, they're more well-defined within that, within that document. So assumptions just are, what do we need to assume is true as it relates to this service. And then external factors are things that affect your service delivery that you don't have control over. So uh, process map or service map. Um, as I said, I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time on this. Most of most people have seen this, uh, but this is just an example of what this service map looked like. Um, I recommend using swim lane diagrams uh, because that will help you understand who your key players are in the process. Uh, and other than that, you just want to see what the process flow looks like. You want to have your terminal points. Folks have seen a process map. 
make a process map. That's that's the whole recommendation. Have a process map. <laughs> so uh, the performance measure implementation plan. Uh, so there are two key elements to this. Uh, the first is getting management approval for your performance measure. Uh, so you want to develop these metrics and you want to execute your implementation plans. They are bodies of work. You'll have action items listed in here. Um, and there will usually be new responsibilities. Uh, somebody is going to have to own these measures. Um, somebody can own all of them in a portfolio. Individuals can own them. That's kind of a you know choose your own adventure, if you will. Uh, but it's really important when you say, hey, we have a new performance measure, it becomes part of your performance portfolio. Uh, you want to make sure that your leadership gets access so that they can make decisions off of it so that you can make change related to it so that you can add value to your customers. Uh, also, change management. Um, you might need to do new training. If you're changing the process around a bunch, you might have to have new training, right? Um, you also might need to use new tools. Uh, we, for example, use Power BI uh, to do dashboards and things like that. But in essence, this is just a how do you get from nothing to having a performance measure? Uh, it includes stuff like the name of the performance measure, a description, who's going to own it, uh, what's our current state, and then an action plan for how to get there. The most important elements are this are how are you going to collect the data? Does it exist at all? Um, and then making sure that you have clearly identified action steps to take you to the point where you are collecting that data uh, and you have it you know, in a dashboard or in an Excel sheet. It happens, right? Um, but how are we going to get from where we don't have a measure to where we do? And it's fairly self-explanatory. Again, I won't waste your time with it. You're going to get this tool. Um, you're going to be able to fill it out, walk through, ask questions at a later point. And then finally, the service brief. Um, this is just, we wanted a one pager that showed you as much as we possibly could about the service without overwhelming folks. Um, but the key elements here are, uh, we you'll see, we pull a ton of this from the logic model. Uh, we actually pull from each of the different deliverables that we did before. Like I said, this is a culmination of all the work that's been done previously. Uh, so you got your goal statement, uh, you have a description of the service, again, critical for your customers to make sure they're requesting the right thing. Um, in for the sake of transparency and also a better understanding of what the service is, we identify the core activities for the service. Uh, what are the major elements that make it up? And then you talk about who's your service owner. Um, is there an expectation around the service, a service level expectation or a performance measure? Um, are there other related services? And then finally, the most important one, how do you request it? Now, it's not a huge issue in the service catalog, right? Because we actually, it's very clear, it actually shows up next to where you would request it, but not in all cases are you going to have as beautiful and effective a service catalog as Jason has set up. Uh, so folks might need to know, hey, I need to send an email to somebody. Uh, you know, Who do I actually talk to about this service? So that's a really critical piece too. Contact information, how you initiate a service request, and is there additional information about your service? Ooh, so that's all of the information I have related to service development. Uh, as I said, you're going to get those templates. They're going to be agnostic to, for organization. Uh, but that's the basic process that you go through to get you to the point where your services are well enough to find to go into a service catalog, which is what Jason is going to be talking about next. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. All right. So let's talk about building and managing your service catalog here. I'm going to drop in the chat a link to our service catalog. It's public facing. You can access it, see all the good stuff that Jacob just talked about. Um, there is kind of a conceptual starting point, I think, that um, you're going to run across when you're building your catalog. What you want is your customers to be able to engage, interact, find your catalog, and use it. And they think it's easy. They think it's it's straightforward. It's clear. It gives them the information they need to engage with you. Um, but you and your leadership team need to know that there's quite a bit of work behind it, right? That's where it's the iceberg effect, where you're seeing the tip, the customer's seeing the very tip of the iceberg, but there's a ton of underlying work that goes into making it uh, a very valuable part of your organization. So that's kind of the key concept when your leadership say, hey, I want a service catalog. Um, if they do that, just let them know that it's a good body of work. It's worthwhile, but uh, it's it's an undertaking. So good thing to know. Uh, I am an IT person, and so I used a, a uh, IT service management framework called ITIL. Um, not everybody's an IT person, but ITIL has uh, morphed over the years from being very IT focused 
it's information technology infrastructure, to being more business driven. So the underlying uh, um, kind of concept behind ITIL is delivering value to your customers and how do you do that better, right? And uh, what they really preach is, is to mature your business operations, right? So what you're seeing in this giant circle over here is some about, I don't know, about a third of the different practice areas of ITIL. So they're saying, hey, you should learn how to do supplier management, for instance, and build some process and maturation behind that. That way you do it well. All of these are all the same. They're, the basic concept is, is if you're doing something, you probably should mature the underlying business process behind it. That way you do it really well and repeatable. That way you're always delivering value. Not a brain buster there, but it's usually a, a good amount of work to do, uh, very worthwhile. So when the mandate was uh, put to me to build a service catalog for new services in the CEO's office, uh, what I did is I looked at this framework and said, what is the minimum viable uh, business operation maturity that we need to get to and where should we focus our energy? So there's 30 plus practices in ITIL. What we did is we broke them down to the ones you see in front of you. And with some maturation there in development, we were able to pull off the service catalog to the level of service that I was happy with and that our leadership was happy with. And I captured in here, and I know it's probably hard to see, but basically this is the outcome we are shooting for. So asset management, we need to do an inventory of our systems, of our hardware, of access to, to uh, other supporting services that we can get. We need to know what we had to work with before we started, right? Not too hard, but it's really hard to, to get that very far down the road if you don't know that. Service catalog management. So we need to do an inventory of all of our services to build that service portfolio. We want to make sure we don't have overlapping services. We want to make sure that there's not any services that are really struggling. And then we all we do is, you know, build some new services on top of it, stripping resources from maybe some services that need help. So we want to do an inventory to make sure we know what we're working with. Also service portfolio management, the third one. So we want to develop and deploy project prioritization because again, we have limited resources and we want to make sure we're delivering a high degree of value and quality to customers. So we need to make sure that we control the intake, the things that we really want to be doing and we know we're good at. Request fulfillment management. So this whole thing is tucked into a larger request fulfillment process that was full of automation and tracking that we did. Um, and so building that out, and developing the whole request end to end was what we were doing. And so that needed attention because you don't want requests to come in to an empty mailbox, for instance, or come in and it's a month later and you respond back, oh, we can't help you, right? And I think we probably all experienced that before dealing with vendors. Um, it happens, we don't want to do it. Service level management, as uh, Jacob said, you design your performance metrics, but then what happens, right? You've got them on your document, is there some data you've got to be uh, curating there and managing? Or how do you support all the actions that that follow up with your performance measures and when that data comes in? How do you ex explain it to the leadership? How do the leadership use that? There's some key components there that if you don't act on that and mature it, you're really going to miss an opportunity. Release and deployment management. We are delivering IT services that people count on. And so when we release something, we want to make sure that the Custer, customer of the new custodian of the service knows how to use it and how to request for support. And so you got to make sure that you've ensured those services out. Continual improvement doesn't need a lot of uh, explanation. Uh, and the final one is knowledge management. So I think uh, Jacob touched on this. You want to be able to train new people when they come into your service line and, and how you deliver services. And also you want to make sure that uh, your management knows that this is a resource that we need to keep growing to support the underlying business processes. So those are what we focused on. We could have focused on all 30, but these were the minimum viable that we did. And again, we used a lot of technology and automation. And so this was really vital. You could shrink this down depending on the criticality of the service, um, the number of people you're serving and, and a number of other factors. So don't think this is like, you know, the, the tell all of, of uh, what you gotta do to be prepared. So, the service development uh, effort itself, uh, Jacob talked a lot a bit about the components. Um, what we did is we started a workbook and it'll become part of your tool set that uh, the good folks at Bang uh, have now for you and it'll be blank. Um, and I will actually, I will bring it up right now, but I'll describe kind of what we did first. 
is we did an inventory of the services, as Jacob said, and that became our service portfolio. Now, it wasn't 100 percent. It was probably about 75 to 80 percent. And that's just fine because you know what you do probably, you know, off the top of your head, probably 60 or 70 percent. And that's the critical stuff. But you want to push it to that 75 to 80 percent because there's underlying services and work that your folks are doing. Um, that that are supporting probably your critical stuff. And you want to get to that layer. That way you capture it and figure out how mature it is and, and if you need to apply a little attention to it. And those usually support the things that end up in your service catalog. So ID your hotspots, low hanging fruit. That's what we did. Uh, we had a mandate for new services related to data specifically. We had about 40 different services, some of them direct, i.e. to the customer that go into a catalog at some point, and indirect that supported uh, usually you know, those direct services. We ID'd the services that we wanted to develop and started working through them, started working through the documentation that Jacob shared, but also, like I said, some of the automation and technology that we're using to support the end-to-end -end request phone service. Then we piloted our services. Uh, I see a number of great uh, folks in the audience here that I've worked with, um, but we piloted with some great agencies. We set the stage that, hey, we're piloting this, you're learning with us, and let us uh, help you the best we can, but tell us and give us feedback the whole time so we get this thing down pat. And uh, our partners were really great, and uh, I think the outcomes really speak for themselves, um, and it, it was really successful. So piloting and maturing was, it was a big part of it. And finally, we uh, deployed and, you know, all along these uh, steps, there was hiccups, there was changes, so we had to be kind of agile and we had to modify and, and rescope and work with our leadership and partners. So now what I'll do is I'll kind of show you folks the workbook because I don't know about you, but I love Excel spreadsheets, but uh, I'll be brief. And again, you're going to get this tool um, to use at your leisure. So real brief instructions page kind of outlines the whole spreadsheet. This is the first dump. This is all of our services, right? From, I think we had um, grant management through um, managing uh, enterprise platforms to uh, access management. So we had like about 40 different services in here. And what we did is we captured about 80% of them. And then we went through and said, all right, where are they as far as maturity go? Um, how complex are they? You know, are they simple? Like somebody calls in, you know, we enter in uh, two pieces of data and hit enter and that's it. That's the entire process. That's relatively easy to do and some are very complex that took months to do. We identified the service type, again, direct, i.e. to you, the customer, or indirect in support of those services. And then what we did is we did some initial review notes and said whether or not we wanted to include them in further development for eventual release into the catalog. So conceptually, two big things here. The portfolio is like everything, right? And the catalog is what the customer is going to use to find services that you would give directly to them. So what we're doing is taking the large and shrinking it all the way down to the catalog. I won't go into this too much, but what we were going through is is again we had a, a list a, a long list into a shorter list hey these are services that we would like to mature in and in a, deploy to a catalog it takes work as uh, jacob just showed you uh, and so you got to prioritize and so we went from i think six or seven that we wanted to get done and that shrank down to three just because you know the climate was changing a little bit the environment and uh, resources were drying up in certain areas so we went from six to three that was okay because you know we checked with our sponsor and and they were good to go. But here is where we we went through that uh, name, brief description, all the same stuff as before. But here we're qualifying what our services is, is is going to look like and what it's not going to look like. For instance, if we're doing ETL work, uh, extract, transform, and load, we are not going to be doing um, uh, sensitive data for a pilot, right? Uh, we needed to work through some things with security before we did any of that. So what we were doing is setting up some expectations to the agencies that during the pilot to, to launch these services, we weren't going to touch sensitive data just because it'd be uh, problematic for us and we weren't quite mature enough to do it. Doesn't mean we can't do it now, but I'd encourage you to put some guardrails on so your pilot does what it really needs to do, which is get that workflow tested, 
right? Get the, the performance ma management tested. Um, it doesn't have to boil the ocean. What it can do is really get the gears turning because that's what you want to work out the bugs and the gears that you can refine later on. And that's what we did here. So again, we went from about six or seven, I think, to three uh, for further evaluation. Right, this is all the way over. Scoot this over my widescreen. Um, so here you've got uh, a view of, of what our, our Excel spreadsheet service catalog looks like. So this is what I use internally to manage our, our services. And this just has one of them. Um, and I won't go through this uh, every column, but the key ones are, and again, you'll have a copy of this, is I've got the documents linked. I've got the service brief linked. I've got the request fulfillment uh, workflow link. I've got the SOPM link. So we designed a whole SOPM. Um, we've got the customer satisfaction identified as a performance measure. We've got a link to that so we can see the dashboard. In other words, if I won the lottery tomorrow, um, Catherine, the CDO, could come in or Jake could come in and understand our services and understand exactly how they're operating right now without much headache. And that's really the key. So, so this is the documentation that I support. And when we uh, are you know, building new services, developing new services, same process, we identify them and we start going through them here and they end up living in here. Uh, look up, I'm not going to go over. Here are some ITIL practices. Again, uh, they have uh, evolved from an IT specific framework. Um, to a more interdisciplinary framework. It is more business and value driven now, which I appreciate because I'm not a native IT person. I'm more business, but I like IT and I like well working IT. And so this is what we were using when I worked at the data center. So the practices are here. The maturity assessment is here. I encourage you to look at this. Um, you, this can cause people to flinch when they say, when you look at some of these processes and they say, well, how mature is it? And you're like, it runs perfect every day. Well, OK, let's see what your documentation looks like. Let's see where you've had problems. And then what we'll do is we'll just see how mature it is on this scale. And I think what you probably find is people's, you know, estimation of their processes are usually probably a little bit more rosy than they are. And that doesn't mean they're running bad. But it, what it does mean is if they leave their position, it's probably going to fail. Right. Or it's going to stutter so bad that customers are going to react. And that's what you're looking for. It can be running good, but is it good and repeatable? And is it repeatable enough that you can tune it up and make it even better? This is what this is getting to. So understand the sensitivities of it, but also that it's vitally important to understand if you want a well-running service that isn't only dependent on one individual and that one individual running 100% of the time, because we all have lives, we all get sick, we've got kids, like it happens. And that's what this is about. And then I include some general service descriptions. These are from IT stuff, um, uh, research vendors, so it might not be applicable, but I left them in just for grins. Let's get back to that PowerPoint, shall we? OK. I'll switch my display here. Just swap me. Here we go. OK, so we talked about the tool, and that's the tool we work through, and that's also the tool that um, I'm currently using in development. So what we included with our catalog, and I dropped the link in there, um, what we wanted to do, we had a couple different requirements and we had to change the last minute uh, where we host the catalog. We were gonna do it in SharePoint and that fell through. And so we had to pivot over to the open data portal. Totally fine, um, but know that stuff like that happens. So we wanted accessible. Uh, our, our sponsor did want this public facing. You might have something that's just internal, right? Or it might be in the M365 environment. So other business units within your organization can see it or something like that. Totally cool. We wanted it externally facing. So that poses some challenges, both uh, politically and technically. So uh, we have some clear service tiles. So if you follow the link, you'll see these. Nice and clear, they've got a title that's not jargon based, it's not overly technical, um, and also a brief description that kind of lets the business or the customer understand what this means to their business. In this case, ETL might be a little jargony, but it lets them know that, hey, if you want to get your data from A to B, we're, we're the ones to uh, deliver that for you. Same with our other uh, tiles. As Jacob noted, the service brief is there, right? It gives a very clear, or, or we try to be as, as clear as you can be in one page, a clear description of what it is that the folks are engaging in. And also it communicates to them who's responsible for it, the service measures around it. 
I mean, I, I'm a customer from organizations and I'd love it if they told me what the service levels were for every single service I ever procured or or bought, right? You don't see it a lot, except in the contract that's buried somewhere. Uh, so this is a neat bonus, but that is present. Um, we also have request the service. And so, um, as Jacob said, you want to, your customers to be able to engage this very easily. Um, in this case, it is a, um, a mail to that's built out with a subject line that goes into an automated intake process. Um, you could do forms. Forms is another great way to do it, as long as you keep it nice and clean. Uh, we, we might upgrade to a form just because we like the way the data comes into our automation, but this works just fine. Make it easy. That's what I would say. Make it very easy and clear. Uh, and then finally, suggest a service. Um, there's gaps. We've got three services, right? And the data life cycles uh, huge. And so if there's a need out there, we want agencies to express it to us. And this is where we capture it, among other avenues. But these are really the core components uh, of our service catalog. And they're there and you can check them out. Um, so expanding the catalog, uh, I'm pretty entrepreneurial. Uh, I'm glad our CDO is as well. So we like to figure out where the needs are and try to meet them. So uh, one of the things we do a lot is listening to agency needs where they're struggling, right? And gather that data and collect it and figure out, all right, is this a shared need? Are multiple agencies struggles with this? And what are the characteristics of the agencies who are struggling with it, right? That's key. Um, we also want to, um, we also want to align um, our service development to goals, right? So, for instance, your your new leadership might have um, some new constituents that they would like to have outreach to for equity purposes or something like that. Well, that's going to be uh, a new probably new service line or a, a significant change in services. You know, how do you actually outreach? How do you collect the data? How do you make sure your data is good? Uh, and do you have to change any of the processes in there? Likely, right? So aligning your goals will be a new service line. Uh, it's something to, to keep that uh, hopper moving, if you, will, if you will. And then being opportunistic, right? So um, one of the things we're doing right now is we're working with an agency who's doing some data modernization. It's a good opportunity for us to learn about data modernization at an agency level and what the struggles they go through. And so we are getting on board with that and giving them all the support we can because it's a great opportunity for us to learn. Uh, something else you folks can do as well. Uh, if you have sister agencies in other uh, other states, uh, what are they doing and how are they doing it? It's a good opportunity to learn and see uh, what's going on out there and how you can grow your your catalog. Um, beyond kind of the new services, um, stepping back to that service portfolio, I said there's about 40 of those. Some of those uh, services in there in the portfolio aren't public facing, but they're indirect. And they needed some maturation, right? Because frankly, they they hadn't got the attention they needed or the resources. And so what we did is, uh, and I encourage you to do this as well, is to communicate to leadership that that the the areas in your portfolio that that need some attention should get it, and you should apply some of these same tools and processes to them. They don't have to go in the catalog, obviously, but to shore up those supporting indirect services will definitely help your rest of your business. Um, so definitely something that we're doing. And I talked about seizing opportunities a little bit. And then the outcomes, like I said, you're going to get new services. That's great. You're going to mature your process for existing services. That's very great, but it's a little kind of uh, less visible, right? So you're going to have to push those a little harder. And then in our case, we love to increase partnership and collaboration. Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, continual improvement is really key, and tying this all together into one kind of automated system was the goal. Uh, I have done most of these components uh, manually and disparately, um, and it's it's very painful, right? It's incredibly painful, um, but lessons learned uh, in an automated way is very valuable. Uh, we have some great staff, and they were engaged in this. Um, and we've got it pretty well automated out, but we're collecting uh, continual improvement uh, data on our responsiveness during the project. And I think a, a key thing to understand is you know, lessons learned and like customer satisfaction are very different things. One, we're looking at uh, what happened during the development of our, our service delivery. And the other one is how well our service actually met the business needs. Usually it's like leadership who respond to that. But in this case, we are collecting data on our responsiveness um, how well our partnership worked back and forth, our communications, meeting expectations, objective development, you know, those kind of things that make for a good project. 
and we've got the processes that make sure that we actually uh, act on this data when it comes in, which is really important. Um, just a couple uh, notes about why this is important. Um, we want to know how our projects are doing, good or bad. In fact, if it's bad, that's even better because we'd like to improve fast. Um, our staff uh, really can sometimes struggle with projects as well. So if there's something internally we can do or tool them up or train them up, it's really good to know. Um, and leadership. Uh, if any of you have owned a process before, um, sometimes it, it can be hard uh, to describe the struggles uh, to leadership. Lessons learned are a great way to do that in a constructive way, right? So um, helps you get support, helps you get resources. So the, the performance element of this and all of our services that go through our process get this um, is really critical. It's a short survey that goes out to all our customers, asking them real basic stuff. We use a net promoter score, um, so it's not painful for them to fill out. It's quick and easy, and it gives us the information we need. Um, specifically, did we meet the business needs? Our customers uh, make sure that they they get a voice heard if they weren't satisfied, which is good because we need to learn. Um, also, our staff know that their work impacts customers, and we share this with our staff when we get this in. Um, I used to love delivering services and getting feedback. Sometimes it wasn't good. That happens, what we learn, but I love getting positive feedback. Um, don't we all? Also, leadership, uh, we made sure we created metrics that they can respond to. So if something comes in, uh, good or bad, they know how to respond, but also that they can share up. Um, we have been in a great economic climate for a long time now. Uh, when I started with the state, it was the opposite. And so developing metrics like this and sharing it with our leadership team was vital because we needed to communicate our value to the legislature, to the governor's office, and make sure that they knew what we were doing and how our customers felt about it. That way we weren't on the cutting block or you know something else. Um, so I'd encourage you to do this. Uh, it can be done relatively easy um, and the tools at our disposal now uh, like Power BI make it really, really easy to, to do and deploy and make available to your leadership and teams. So some tips and tricks I was thinking about uh, when we did this. Again, this is couched in a, in a broader request fulfillment process and automation we were doing, but fail fast, fail often. One of our previous uh, CIOs used to say, so take small steps and don't be scared to adapt or adjust your scope. Um, Again, you're 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 working through a changing environment. This is going to take some time, so be flexible and set expectations that way. Again, we were working with agency partners, and we set the expectations that we were learning. Things are going to get rocky. Be patient with us, and we'll appreciate it. And it worked really well. Set expectations that way. Automation. Uh, we've got some great tools for automation. Uh, I heard this week that uh, the M365 platform is getting support contracts uh, for the Power Automate sweet uh, that is some vitally powerful tools for for internal processes uh, that's what we used um, it take a takes a little bit to get them up but once they're running they work pretty darn good i encourage you to look at it and uh, talk to your leadership about it once those support contracts go online uh, you'll have good support to get those set up and maintained so automation is key uh, focus on value again um, whatever we do somebody's got to know what the value proposition is. If they forget, then then we get into trouble. So your customers need to know it. Your staff needs to know what they're delivering the value is and leadership all need to feel it. They really need to understand the value proposition for why you're there. If you can't explain it, I would I would step back for a second and, and think about it. Uh, systems thinking. So we sketched all of this out on paper uh, before we did any kind of visio diagrams or anything like that, and then figured out, all right, what are our goals? We started kind of chalking it up. And then what are the underlying systems, right? Again, we did some asset work, but we had technical systems, we had people processes, we had existing systems that were manual. So we had to meld them all together. And system thinking really helped because some of those subsystems we were able to wipe out and automate, which was really great. Uh, some we weren't, and they're still manual, and that's okay. Uh, but we couldn't have done that um, at the speed we wanted to without some systems thinking and an end to end. What are the inputs and outputs, and how do things interact? Um, it was it was very beneficial. Uh, right size. Don't be scared to roll back your scope. Right, you can't boil the ocean, or you know you can't uh, take on everything. So we started, like I said, like six or seven services we really wanted to get out the door. It became three. Right. 
captured that in our after action report. We did a change management process on it, um, explained that we just couldn't do it. It's OK. Get your three out the door. That's a great start. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. It takes time. That's out of there. And then leadership, uh, as Jacob said, we had good, strong leadership across EIS and at the CDOs office. Um, and to support our leadership, we created the metrics that they can communicate out. Hey, we're doing a good job. You know, let's let's it, it works two ways, right? You create metrics for leadership. That way you're never on the chopping block or if you are, you've got a good case to stay. But also when you ask for resources, you could say, hey, this is the customer base we're serving and they are happy with our services. Give us this extra system or the, this extra staff. Um, and that's how I, I think about it. So getting our leadership on board and making sure they always have those reports handy with live data is key. And that is it. I'm all done talking. So I'll kick it back over to our host or Jacob. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions for our presenters today? Are you guys able to hear me okay? Uh -oh. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Um, never know if my headset's going to work. <clears throat> okay, I'll take back the screen share. Um, does anybody have any experience with um, a service catalog? Positive or negative? Oh, Leslie. See one hand raised. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, I just wanted to get I, I this is all kind of new for me and it's really fascinating and it all just really syncs up with a lot of my kind of uh, project management philosophy and, and process improvement ideas that I've had over time and when I'm looking at um, different agencies at the state and I'm just wondering if you could give us some examples you gave some great IT examples um what would we see in a service catalog for you know more of a human <laughs> services department like licensing or you know different i'm just kind of relating it to my work more yeah it, i think the major takeaway here it, it's anything that you have a direct customer for can go in a service catalog um like uh, I, I used to work for the health department um, and we had a lot of you know mental health services are a perfect example of a direct service provision. Now, obviously, you're not going to have um, <clears throat> You know, the same kind of it wouldn't your catalog wouldn't look the same as it would for an IT service catalog. Uh, but, you know, we had brochures that say, hey, here are the types of service that you can receive from us. Um, you know, here are the various programs that it supports, um, you know, whether it's WIC, uh, whether it's uh, specific mental health services, behavioral health, uh, developmental disabilities. You know, we had all these different, these are the things we offer through the various programs that we support at the health department. Uh, and, you know, this is what you can request. This is what you can come on in for. This is what you can expect to see out of it. So, and yeah, it's, I, I saw another suggestion in the chat there, recruitment services. I mean, basically just think of anything that your organization does. Uh, we do a bunch of consultative services, for example. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, subject matter expertise related services. I mentioned there's different types of services uh, that maybe if your customers are internal focused, you could have a catalog for things like telecom, uh, things like, um, heck, you know, uh, janitorial services, you know, you, you name it. Uh, if your customer is itching to request that service, it can go into a service catalog. So um, just anything with a defined customer uh, and anything that uh, people would want to request from you are the sorts of things that could go into a service catalog. And it looks like we have another question from Tim. Thanks, yeah. Um, looking back at your workflow and deliverables slide, it started with the logic model building 
and I guess this assumes that you had already developed just a, a flat list of services. Yes. And if so, you know, how did do you have any advice for how to go about um, eliciting and developing that list of services in the first place? Yeah, and <clears throat> it's tougher than uh, one might think, uh, believe me. Um, typically, you want to start with uh, what are the things that folks within your office or or your team do day to day? Um, because that's where you're going to, to articulate more clearly uh, what it is that's actually being delivered. Um, you usually do the stuff you're doing for some reason. Uh, you need to go back and look at, you know, why are we doing this in the first place? Who are the customers? Um, you know, your initial service list should be, and, and you heard Jason mention this, uh, we only got to 75 or 80% as we were doing ours because we went through this process too for data governance and transparency where we just said, okay, we're going to throw a bunch of stuff on the wall and see what it is that actually kind of like forms itself into a service. Uh, so starting with the work that folks do every day is, is in my opinion, the best suggestion uh, because it tells you what people have their time focused on. Um, it tells you, and and again, typically you're doing that for some particular reason, whether it's part of a program, uh, whether it's part of people requesting services. So go through and, and talk to, to staff within your group and say, hey, what do you do day to day? Who do you do it for? Um, and usually from that, you can start to get an idea of what the major categories of services are. Um, what we ended up with were a lot of kind of service packages where we had uh, one overarching theme like consultative services covered a couple different services that we offered. Uh, data services, I mean, you just saw in the catalog, we had three kind of critical data services that we're providing to folks. So typically those patterns will start to emerge, but finding your initial service list isn't, that's really why we're doing this work in the first place, uh, is we're trying to better understand what it is that we do, what we're offering to folks. And in a lot of cases, it just starts with, with conversations about what are we doing? Uh, what do you spend your time with? Um, and uh, looking at your programs as well is a really big one because a lot of your programs will have really defined service offerings uh, that you can draw from to say, okay, as part of this program, we're expected to do X, Y, Z. X, Y, Z are probably services that you're offering. Uh, so those are kind of the two major suggestions I would have. Um, it's it's a brainstorming session to start with. I mean, there, there's no easy way to just point out, hey, yeah, these are all the services we do if you don't have this documentation already, which is why we're doing it. So talk to your subject matter experts, just ask what is it we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and then see how you can form those into a recognizable service. And then uh, look at your programs and say, what are the program elements that look like services to us? The other thing you can think about is looking, uh, doing some research into comparable uh, divisions or programs or looking at other organizations and see how they define their services. If they do a really similar thing to, if, if you're an IT shop, for example, you could just go to look at what other IT shops do. What are their defined services? Because typically if you can find a comparable uh, organization or program or team or what have you, uh, they'll do something really similar to you. Even if there are some nuances in terms of how it's executed, that will give you a good base to look at. Um, we did a lot of that for our service catalogs, um, you know, looking at what other organizations did, how they set it up, um, you know, and we found, for example, we, we talked about that, that boilerplate request fulfillment process. We found that a bunch of our services just have, you know, their request fulfillment in, in some way, shape, or form, and then we just made one standard set, and then we tweaked off of that to, to make sure that it was actually reflective of the service being provided. So that's a lot of what I just said there, um, but I think that all of those things contribute to helping you develop that initial service list. Um, it's There's not like a I mean, you can go through a really formal process to do it. Most people don't have the time or the energy or the resources to do that. Um, usually you're just want, gonna wanna brainstorm and look at those comparables, look at your programs for inspiration, and then just talk to people about what it is they do day to day. Thank you. Of course. And, and a fun fact that we find out and I've experienced this in that organization is, once you do this inventory of your services, you're going to find more than likely uh, services that you wonder why you're doing, that you're not resourced to do, and that that you'll be able to actually work towards eliminating, transferring, or something like that. 
it's it's good because what it does is it frees up resources, frees up time, so you can focus it on the stuff you want to be doing and not on these ad hoc or you know kind of other kind of requests that are coming in. So another bonus for uh, leadership when you're trying to explain to them what it is you're trying to do. It doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, so our next session is February 20th, and it looks like we're gonna go over P3 updates, Agile Oversight and PPM Modern UX. We'll have a virtual um, via Teams, the same setup. We're looking at sometime in the future having an in-person meeting which will be nice. And then we have our BA <clears throat> network at Oregon Gov website and should have all of those um, extra flyers from Jason and Jacob to go through. And I want to thank you, Jacob and Jason, for being able to present today for our bank forum. Oh, Julian. Looks like Julian and Heather both have last minute questions. Do you guys have a few moments? Of course. Perfect. No, I actually accidentally hit the hands up. I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> I meant to clap. <laughs> I did the same thing. <laughs> Never mind. So no glad questions. I wasn't the only one. <laughs> All right. With that, I will let everybody get back to work. Thanks so Thank much you. for having us today, folks. We really appreciate Thanks, the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you.